This time it's that high, I'm just... I have a glue in the back of my hair. Hello, my it's friends. It is me, bare-faced, greasy hair, glasses wearing. Me. There is a reason for that, though. I'm not just being lazy. I mean, I, mean, I am being a bit lazy, but... If you are new here, my name is Hazel Jane, and I paint crap on my face. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing today. Bear with me on this one, because I've never done a video like this before, so this might be a bit... Rough. Basically. I decided that it was very, very long overdue for me to turn myself into one of the infamous Monster High characters. Now, I know I keep banging on about them, but bear with me for a second. One of my favourite brands, Kill Stuff, has released a collection with Monster High. There will be a separate video going up reviewing a few of the pieces, but it kind of gave me that final kick up the arse to actually do the Monster High makeup. Now, I was just going to do like a normal video, like maybe a bit of a tutorial, kind of talking through it. But I've realised I really struggle to talk about makeup as I'm applying it. I don't know what it is. My brain just can't comprehend doing both at the same time. I was editing a video that I did where I tried to do that. And I just had this habit of like starting a sentence and then just... Where, where were the ends of my sentences? There were none. So I was trying to wrap my brains... Brains? I, d I definitely don't have plural. I think I barely even have one. I was trying to rack my brain for a few ideas on what I did. Alongside this, I started looking up a bit of the history and lore behind Monster High characters. If you're not familiar with Monster High, the whole concept is that it's set in a high school and all of the kids who go there are like the daughters and granddaughters and grandsons and the, the offspring, the next generation of the most famous monsters and ghouls and all that kind of thing. It's originally based around this one girl who starts at school. Her name is Frankie Stein. I'm sure you can guess what monster family she is a part of, but she has friends like Draculaura, Claudine Wolf. I mean, that one's a bit, that one's a bit more on the nose, but I mean, they're all on the nose, let's face it. Now, I started looking into Frankenstein, the history of Frankenstein, the novels, the films, the author, Mary Shelley. I fell into the biggest rabbit hole looking into this and like the after effects of the Frank the original novel on pop culture. I think I ended up writing like 13 pages of notes because I just found it so fascinating. So for me to get to the point that I'm actually trying to make, I thought it would be kind of cool if while I'm turning myself into Ms. Frankie Stein, I could basically just sit here and monologue for a little while about the special interest I have in monsters and ghouls. So yeah. Now, normally I would start my videos with contacts in already, but because I'm going to be putting coloured contacts in, I'm not doing that whole thing where I change them out, like, once I finish the makeup, because I end up with crap in my... just... no. So now I'm going to put the coloured contacts in quick, and then we'll crack on with the next step and get into the story. Oh, this is... this is off to a great start. Okay, the first actual makeup step that I'm going to do is a little bit of SFX work for the neck vaults, which, spoiler alert, not in the original novel. But they are on the Frankenstein doll, and it was an excuse to make my own little neck ball. Look how cute they are. So, Frankenstein. You've all known him, you've all heard of him, you've all probably used the name incorrectly. I know I have. So the more accurate thing to say would be Frankenstein the monster. Big tall guy, flat head. So Frankenstein is based on the novel of the same name, written by Mary Shelley in 1818. Now the novel is also subtitled The Modern Prometheus, which I'll explain that a little bit later on, because at first I was like, eh? The novel is considered one of the earliest examples of science fiction, if not the example of science fiction. I know in some circles, Mary Shelley is actually referred to as the mother of science fiction, which I've got to be honest, like, I loved that. I loved the fact that it was a woman who kind of invented that genre. So, you go, Glenn Gogo. Oh, also just a slight disclaimer warning. There are quite a few sort of dark themes that I'm going to be talking about. Obviously, within the novel itself, there's themes of murder and body parts and rogue science experiments but there's a lot of discussion of death and loss grief a little bit of mention of suicide and just a few heads up about that kind of thing please stick please stick please stick please stick what hey Ooh. oh that looks so grim anyway the term franken has often been used as like a prefix for words to describe a to to describe things that people consider like artificial monstrosities terms like franken food is often used in debates about like food origins and things like that and it can also mean anything that's assembled together haphazardly from leftover bits and 
spare bits, especially bits that have been discarded by other people. Like if you have a car that's made out of spare parts, some people would refer to it as like a Franken car. A famous example was Eddie Van Halen, who played a guitar that was built in such a way that he referred to it as the Frankenstrat. There's even a term used by people who abuse crystal meth called Frankensteining, and it's the act of like calming yourself down by disassembling and then reassembling objects to like it's kind of a shame that that's a phrase that's been adopted by drug addicts. I like the idea of like tinkering with things being referred to as Frankensteining, but oh, well, they ruined it. Oh, I forgot to take all my piercings out. Yeah. So, Miss Mary Shelley. Originally born Mary Godwin, but I'm just going to refer to her as Mary Shelley. She was born on the 30th of August in 1797. She was an English novelist, but she also edited and promoted a lot of her like later husband's work. He was a romantic poet and philosopher. Now, Mary's parents were quite famous themselves. Like, her father was also a novelist and a political philosopher, while her mother was a women's rights advocate and philosopher. She's like a whole family of philosophers. Also, why is that not like a job title anymore? You don't really get philosophers. If they philosophize everything now. Now, unfortunately, Mary's mother died like 11 days after giving birth to her. So she was raised predominantly by her father who educated her himself, but really encouraged her to take on his like quite extreme anarchist sort of political views. So when Mary was four, her father actually ended up remarrying their neighbour. But it's said that Mary did not have a good relationship with her stepmother. But this marriage brought in like a stepsister and yeah. There was a lot more information obviously about her childhood and home life, but it wasn't really too relevant to what I wanted to talk about. So we're just gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead a few years. So the year is 1814. Mary is 16, 17 years old. Anarchist little lady that she is. She actually starts a bit of a romantic relationship with one of her father's political followers, who was a little bit older than she was. So she was 16 and he was 21. Now, he was actually already married. Like, okay, Mary. Now, his name was Percy Shelley. So, yeah. He's already married. He has a kid. I read in a few places that he had, like, an estranged relationship with his wife, but he was still married and, you know, the age difference when she's that young, by modern day standards, it's kind of icky. It's, it's very icky, actually. Like, she's a child, basically. But So they started having, like, secret meetings and sneaking off to be with each other, and they would often meet at the gravesite of her mother, which, I mean, a aesthetics, I guess, is reported that she was, like, super comfortable around him and she found a lot of peace by being by her mother's burial site. So yeah, that's just, that's where she used to meet. A lot of people also believe that she may have lost her virginity to Percy on her mother's grave. I mean, go off, I guess. So a little bit later on that year, Mary and Percy left for France and travelled through Europe, along with Mary's stepsister, whose name I can't remember again. Okay, I'm, I'm so good at this. I'm so good at storytelling. I never found anything that, like, confirmed this, but it is also believed that Percy and the stepsister eventually became, like, lovers on the side, which... Damn, Percy. You're kind of a dick. I'm the stepsister too, actually. Like, screw you guys. When they returned from their little trip around Europe, Mary was, in fact, pregnant. Which, you know, married man, several years her senior. Mary would give birth to the baby, but the baby was born, I think, like, two months prematurely. And, unfortunately, the baby died very early on in infancy, which, I mean, it just, it wrecked Mary, which is completely understandable. It was awful, but it sent her into like a very acute depression. And yeah, it just, it, this sucks. I can't imagine that. It's awful. But her and Percy continued to see each other, even though he was still married. And for the two years that they were seeing each other while he was still married, they faced, obviously, a lot of ostracism from other people. They were dealing with the death of their daughter. They were also dealing with a lot of debt. Percy came from a really wealthy family, but he kind of rebelled against them. Like, they didn't, they didn't get on. Generally, they didn't have a lot of money, so they struggled a lot financially. Now, after the death of their daughter, they did go on to have, I think, three other children. And again, unfortunately, two of them would both die during infancy. But the fourth child did survive and went on and grew up and blah, blah, blah. The death of her first daughter, really, that was... I don't think Mary ever really got over it. I mean, how do you get over something like that? Especially if you then have further tragedies within your, like, family. So after those two years in 1816, Percy's first wife... First wife? Percy's wife. I mean, technically it was his first wife, but at the time, 
just his wife. She ended up committing suicide. I did see a few people speculating where there was some like foul play involved in that, but it's mostly been dismissed by people as not foul play. Apparently she used to talk about it quite a lot. I mean, she was really obviously very unhappy with Percy. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just sad. I feel really bad for her. But obviously after she had died, Percy and Mary were then free to get married. Mary's father especially like insisted that they made it legal and official and all recognised and above board and everything like that. So they did. And Mary Godwin became Mary Shelley. I hate painting inside my ears. It's giving Squidward. So obviously Mary was a writer, as was her husband and her father and her mother. She came from a whole big family of writers and very influential people. So when she was growing up, like a lot of big names used to frequent her house and she just grew up around a lot of n names. Now, among the list of people that she knew and frequented were people like Lord Byron. Both Mary and Percy very famously spent a weekend with Lord Byron, along with their son and, again, her stepsister. Because, like, her stepsister apparently was having an affair with Lord Byron as well. Okay, her stepsister seemed busier than she was. Apparently, Lord Byron had gotten her pregnant. A lot of that going around. So yeah, they all very famously spent a weekend together at like some lodge or something in Geneva, Switzerland. I definitely should have double checked all my research before I started this video. My geography is shocking. It was during this weekend, this little like, people refer to it as like a bit of a writer's retreat because they were all writers and stuff. But it was during this weekend that Mary Shelley came up with the concept for the novel of Frankenstein. Now, just a kind of like semi side note about it. There's been a lot of debate among scholars about the origin of the name Frankenstein because Mary maintained that she came up with the name as part of this like dream vision that she had. However, it has generally been like disputed and sort of disregarded that she didn't she didn't come up with the name herself because I didn't know this, but. Frankenstein was the name of a place in Germany and there was quite a few other places that were called Frankenstein or like had that kind of name. Now on their little weekend trip on their way there they stopped in a place called King I oh, I don't know how to pronounce this so they stopped here which was about 17 kilometers away from a place called Frankenstein Castle. Now this castle about two centuries before was infamous for being the place where an alchemist had been engaging in a lot of experiments. See where we're going with this? But Frankenstein was also the name of a town in Poland. It's since been renamed. And it was the site of this huge scandal in like 1606 involving a lot of grave robbers, which a lot of people do believe is again part of the inspiration for Mary Shelley behind the novel. I mean, you, you line all the facts up, you put them together. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. The pieces are there for the novel to have come together from that. But Mary maintained she came up with the name. During this lovely little trip, the weather was atrocious. Apparently that year was notably bad, sort of weather-wise. So whilst they were on this little, this little retreat, this little getaway, it was often raining a lot. So it meant that they were usually indoors, sitting around the fires. I mean, it was a bunch of like gothic novel writers. So they were talking about life, death, the occult, all kinds of spooky stuff. They were sharing a lot of ghost stories with each other as well. It was after that that Lord Byron proposed they all go off and write their own ghost story. So friendly competition, if you will. Now Mary, Mary, Mary just could not think of one. Every morning when she woke up while they were there, she'd get asked like, oh, have you thought of your story yet? Have you written your story yet? And apparently she recalled being like mortified, having to say, no, I, I haven't got any ideas. I haven't got any inspiration. I haven't written anything. And this went on for a little while. Then one evening, they all sat around the fire discussing, you know, spooky stuff. The topic of conversation turned to the principle of life. Mary noted, and I quote, perhaps a corpse could be reanimated. I'll be honest, I don't fully understand what the whole principle of life thing means in relation to the context of that particular train of thought, but the point is she got that. And she noted that galvanism had given token to that sort of thing. I had to look this up because, I mean, I've heard of the word galvanism, I had no idea what it meant. Galvanism referred to the generation of electric current by chemical action specifically within biological organisms. So basically it's 
generating electricity through living matter kind of thing. What she was basically saying is, yes, perhaps a corpse could be reanimated because this act of using electricity through organic matter could, you know, jumpstart a body sort of thing. So that night, Mary was unable to sleep because she became kind of obsessed with her own imagination and thought process of this whole thing. It just really, really struck a chord with her. And from there, she then wrote her ghost story, which would become the basis for the entire novel of Frankenstein, because it was originally only ever written to be a short story. Now, I managed to find a copy of her little short story, so allow me to attempt a dramatic reading of the origins of Frankenstein. I saw the pale student of unhallowed art kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavour to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Wait, was that the Twilight Zone? I didn't, I didn't mean to do that noise. But yes, super spooky. To be fair though, I have to keep reminding myself, she was like 18, 19 when she wrote that. I don't think I knew what half his words meant at 18. So yes, this was originally meant to be just a short story, you know, for, for funsies. But her husband, Percy, encouraged her to expand on it and keep working on it and turn it into a novel. A lot of people have debated whether or not he deserved any kind of major credit with the novel but then a lot of people have also dismissed it as just being like a bit of a, a bit of a sexist thing going on because obviously she was a female writer but mm, some people felt that Percy's name had a bit more credit to it so he was a bit more involved than people let on but mm, personally Percy no sure you encouraged her to you know continue writing it you were a supportive husband you were not a co-author get your own damn novel sort of stealing other people's stuff Percy another little side note just while I'm bitching about Percy, he actually died when he was 29 years old. So Mary would have been like early 20s. He died in a sailboat accident. And when he was cremated, one of his organs just like refused to burn. It was believed to be his heart. Now, the reason that it wouldn't burn was because it had basically like calcified from a previous illness that he'd had. I believe it was like tuberculosis or something. But yeah, basically his heart had completely calcified. So when he was cremated, it was just he sat there, it didn't burn. Mary then actually kept the heart as a keepsake. She never remarried. And apparently when she died, it was found in her desk wrapped up in pages of one of his poems. It's morbid, but it's romantic as hell. It's another reason why a lot of people refer to Mary Shelley as like the OG goth girl. I mean, to be fair, the the genres of her novel are literally gothic and romantic. She's the it girl for that kind of thing. So if you've read the novel or you're only familiar with the story of Frankenstein and his monster, you may want to skip the next part because I want to give like a little shortened version of the novel and the original story of Frankenstein and the monster. I'd never read the book or seen any of the films, so I didn't know the actual origin stories and I found it really fascinating and I want to talk about it. So deal with it. I don't know why I'm being so sassy about this. Anyhow, story of Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. Again, I promise I will explain that later on. So Frankenstein tells the story of Victor Frankenstein, who is a young scientist who, through a series of unorthodox scientific experiments, creates a sapient life form. So Frankenstein is the scientist. It's kind of a running thing that people use Frankenstein to refer to the monster, and then people correct it, and it's because the monster is actually never given a name. I think I'm going to generally refer to it as, like, the creature. We creature or monster. Depends on how I feel. It was infused with elements of like gothic novels and the romantic movement. So when people hear Frankenstein or Dr. Frankenstein, they often think of the 1931 movie by Universal. You often get the image of like the mad scientist and the hunchback assistant digging up graves and body parts and all that kind of thing. Placing the body on a big slab, letting it get struck by lightning, and the infamous it's alive scenario. Now, the original novel, there is no assistant, there is no grave robbing of parts and frankenstein was not built of spare body parts because frankenstein's monster in the original novel was like eight foot tall and in proportion so it's like proportionally large which is impossible to do if you're using regular body parts you can't use the spare parts of a mini to build a jeep that was definitely the best analogy i could have thought of for that the novel itself is actually written through a series of letters between a man called captain robert walton 
and his sister. So Robert is a failed writer and he is on a little expedition setting out to explore the North Pole. So after Robert and his crew depart for the North Pole, their ship ends up getting trapped by some pack ice. I don't know what that is, don't ask me, but they get stuck. So, you know, great start. But whilst their ship is stuck, they spot a dog sled being driven by a giant creature. Bet you can't guess who that is. Bigfoot! No. So a few hours later, the ice splits and Robert and his crew are then freed. So they carry on their little journey and they find an ice floe yeah. floating around with a very emaciated and um, like half dead man on it. This guy was clearly not well. So they rescue him as the good citizen Samaritans that they are. His poor tiny little ice man is none other than Victor Frankenstein. Now, Victor had been in pursuit of this giant creature, and whilst he's recovering from his little his little ice time nap, he starts telling his story to the captain. Now, he actually starts telling him his like whole life story as a warning to the captain, because he sees a lot of himself in the captain. Like I said, the captain was a failed writer, and he was out on this expedition for glory and I don't know what else. But Victor basically looks at him and he's like, hey, I recognise that kind of obsessive behaviour. Don't do that. Let me tell you why. So it's kind of serving as like a little little moral lesson that no one asked for. But yes, Victor. So as a child, Victor is said to have had a thirst for knowledge and just this kind of obsession with understanding how the world worked. A particular interest in science. He was obsessed with like alchemists and alchemist theories. Really wanting to understand how how stuff worked. So when he was five years old, his parents adopted an orphan named Elizabeth, who Victor planned to marry. When I read that, I was a bit like, huh? Okay, she's an orphan, so they're not related by blood, but she, she's, I mean, she's technically his sister. I know there's different ties we're talking about, but I mean, at five years old, planning to be married off to your sister, I just, mm, that will become relevant later on. But skip forward several years, whilst at university, he excels in chemistry. Shocking. Ah, that was like a... Because the lecture is... That was a good one. His intrinsic neck for chemistry, it leads him to develop these like super secret techniques for imparting life into inorganic matter. And this is where he decided to make a person. As you do. This process of creating a person took him like two years because of the intricacies involved in fibers and muscles and tissues and building a human being. He had to make the creature like eight feet tall and completely in proportion. The novel was super vague about how he did all of this and what he used. It just often referred to his like materials. So whether he was able to like grow these these bits and then put them together. I don't know. Maybe it was like the oldie worldy equivalent of 3D printing. So whilst he's able to sort of create his own materials for the majority of this creature, he does obviously still need organs. Now he doesn't make all of those. A lot of those he pilfers. That was literally the word that they used. A lot of them were pilfered from mortuary houses and graves and things called Char Charnel houses. I'd never heard of these. I had to look it up. So a Charnel house was a vault or building where human skeletal remains are stored, often built near churches for depositing bones that are unearthed whilst digging graves. So I guess there was like an element of grave robbing, kind of. The other way that he got organs was by trapping and vivisecting small animals, like how many small animal organs does it take to create a big human organ? This guy was nuts. He needed a new hobby. So he originally chose all the features and his intention was to make this creature beautiful. But guess what? At least by his own standards, it didn't work. It's monstrously big to begin with. But it's said that the creature was absolutely hideous with dull and watery yellow eyes, yellowing skin, barely covered all the muscles and blood vessels beneath it. Just this big... Ooh. Now Victor, Victor animates his creature, sees his handiwork, is repulsed by his handiwork, and flees. Just, just runs away. That's responsible parenting for you, a-hole. So Victor runs off like the little bitch that he is, and the next day he runs into one of his childhood friends, a man called Henry Cler... Cler... Clerval? 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 Henry. So even though he is terrified of what Henry is going to say about his little 
endeavor. He decides to take Henry back to his lab to show him what he's done, even though apparently he's scared of him. I don't get this man's logic. Like, you, you've abandoned it and it, maybe he just needed a minute. I know I forgot to mention it. When he sees his creation and is like horrified and flees, that whole thing is further compounded by the fact that he never gives the creature a name. Only ever refers to it as like creature or monster or wretch or devil or demon. Whenever he then interacts with the monster, he calls it like a wretched insect and just all these other really horrible names that like, dude. But I, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So he goes to take Henry back to see his creation, but when they get back to the lab, the creature is not there. Hands up who else saw that one coming? Victor, you idiot. So Victor takes Henry back to show him the creature. The creature is no longer there. Somehow as a result of this, Victor falls ill. I don't know. I, I struggle to feel bad for him in this scenario, if I'm honest. But Henry nurses Victor back to health, helps look after him. And apparently after he recovers, Victor just forgets about the creature that he made. And he goes on with his merry little life. And he goes on to study, like, oriental languages or something, and it's described as, like, the happiest time of his life. But his happiness was short-lived. Because, not long after that, Victor receives a letter from his father informing him that his brother has been murdered. Dun dun dun. So Victor travels back home to Geneva, and he apparently sees the creature near the crime scene, and as a result becomes convinced that the creature was behind the murder. I mean, yeah, probably, but you did abandon it. Oh no, the consequences of my own actions. So Victor is convinced that the creature is behind this murder. But Victor's nanny, a woman named Justine Moritz, was originally another person who was adopted by his parents, but she became like his nanny. I don't know how much of an age difference. I mean, this family is weird. But yeah, so this Justine Moritz, she was actually arrested for the brother's murder because in her pocket, they found his brother William's locket, which contained a tiny miniature portrait of his mother. And apparently this was enough evidence that they needed to arrest her and charge her for it. Now, Victor was obviously not convinced that it was Justine. He was convinced it was the monster. But he knew that if he went up and testified that it was this creature that he'd created and abandoned, no one would believe him and nothing would happen. So he just didn't. He just let Justine take the fall for it. Unfortunately, she was hanged for this murder that she didn't commit. All because Victor was like, oh, no one will believe me. Maybe if I just stay quiet, everything will be okay. Anyway, ravaged by grief and guilt and blah, blah, blah. Oh, woe is me, Victor. He decides to take up mountain climbing in the Alps, as you do. So Victor's up in the Alps doing his little mountain climbing. When, guess who shows up? The creature's just there like, yeah, it's me, your son. Lily. The creature communicates with Victor and insists that he hear his tale. Creature. Creature's been on a bit of an adventure. It's a really sad adventure, but so obviously Victor's a little bit a little bit shocked by the fact that this creature is he's suddenly articulate and seems intelligent, and Victor's like, this is this is not how I left you. So the creature recalls his first days of life alone in the wilderness, and he found that people hated him and was scared of him because of how he looked, which led him to fear them in return, and he would just he would hide from everyone. It was just a bad time. Now, during his little involuntary wilderness trek, he discovers this little cottage with a family living there who were really, like, really poor. Connected to this cottage was like an abandoned structure where he just kind of holed up for himself. Now, he kind of observed this family and grew quite attached to them, so he tried to help them any way that he could, but like, secretly so you know he'd collect wood for their fires he'd clear the snow from the pathways for them and just any kind of way that he could stick to the shadows and help them out he did this went on for months during this time he learned that the son of this family was due to marry a turkish woman so he was giving her lessons on how to speak his native language so the creature was listening in on these lessons which is sort of how he learned how to speak and how to write he also found a lost satchel of books in the woods and he used them to help teach himself how to read as well. Poor creature, he's really trying. But this explains how the creature became articulate and intelligent. As he sort of learned more about the family, he grew more and more attached to them. And eventually he he ended up approaching them in the hopes of like being their friend. You know, he had good intentions, but I'm sure you can imagine where this is going. Now, he was smart about it because he entered the house when only the father was present. Now the father was blind. So they spoke and they chatted and they talked and talked and talked and it was all lovely and dandy and he made himself a little friend. Then the rest of the family came home and it just, it went down. I mean, they were just, they were terrified. The son who 
had like inadvertently been the one to teach this creature how to read and speak and communicate with people he ended up attacking him and like driving him out of the house and the creature like he just ran away the next day the family just packed up and just they got the hell out of there they left poor old creature he witnessed them leaving it kind of destroyed his last hope of being accepted by humanity so he just completely swore off ever making friends or being accepted and instead he swore to get his revenge the creature hated victor for abandoning him so he traveled to geneva to try and find him where he just happened to beat victor's brother william now william was obviously terrified of this creature and for some reason in his attempts to like defend himself from this perceived threat from the creature he ended up using like his full name but in like a you know who my parents are like kind of like douchebag kind of way but obviously frankenstein is a fairly recognizable name so obviously the creature hears his name realizes it's a member of victor's family yeah it just it, it sparked the creature into killing william the brother the creature was then the one to take the locket and plant it on the nanny which i guess was just like another like cue to to victor i feel bad for the nanny she did nothing so after telling him this whole story the creature then demands that victor make him a female companion insisting that as a living creature he has a right to happiness which yeah like i get i mean you did murder someone and then frame someone else but so he demands that victor make him a companion and states that if he does we will disappear into the ether and you will never see or hear from us again but on the flip side of that if victor refuses then the creature will continue to kill his friends and family until victor is completely ruined bit extreme now victor fearing for the safety of his family he agrees to create this companion for the monster so that they will leave and leave him alone one of the conditions that the creature gave was that he would oversee victor during the whole process of creating its mate to make sure there was no funny business or anything like that so yeah victor says okay fine yes i'll make your mate so he and his friend henry they travel back to england so they get to perth and then victor insists that they like separate from each other I don't know why. I mean, there is probably a more information in the book. I'm reading the summarised version of it. They get to Perth, they separate. Victor travels on to Orkney, and he believes that the creature is following him, which, given that the creature literally told him, I'm going to oversee everything that you're doing, like, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that the creature would be following him. I don't know why he's being weird about it. So, he gets to work on starting to build this secondary creature, and he is just plagued by premonitions of disaster and death and he starts to panic and worry like oh god what if what if i make this this mate for him and she rejects him and she doesn't like him or what if even worse what if she's more evil than he is or even worse than that what if they do get along and they get along a little bit too well and it leads to this race of like super evil sentient creatures who will just destroy humans like dude is catastrophizing anywho he sees the creature watching him work through the window of the lab and he just decides no no i'm not doing this anymore so while the creature is watching he just completely destroys everything that he's been working on the body of this creature he destroys it he destroys the lab he just all of it just completely abandons shit with the project now obviously mr creature here none too happy about that so he confronts victor and tells him to basically start again carry on finish what you said you were gonna do and victor just refuses so rather than like attack him or anything like that the creature leaves but he leaves him with the threat of i will be with you on your wedding night so yeah with that the creature then leaves so now that the creature has gone victor obviously still has his lab full of equipment and materials that are all like destroyed and messed up where he's just abandoned this experiment and he needs to get rid of them he takes a little boat and he sails out to sea to dispose of all the instruments and materials that he had left over from his workshop so that no one would ever know what he'd been doing i don't know maybe you should have done that the first time around while he is at sea disposing of all his nefarious equipment he falls asleep on the boat when he wakes up there's been like a change in the winds which means that he can't return to the shore he apparently then falls unconscious again it really doesn't take a lot for this guy to drop it just seems like he's constantly falling ill or falling asleep or just maybe he's got low iron he falls unconscious again and he manages to drift to ireland and then when he wakes up he is arrested for murder i'm not gonna lie i was a little bit like huh 
did I, am I missing something here? When did this happen? Like Victor gets acquitted anyway because an eyewitness testimony comes forward and places him in Orkney at the time of the murder. So it's only after this has happened and after he's been acquitted of the murder, Victor then found out who the murder victim was. And da, 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 da. it was Henry Clerval, Victor's old friend. Henry had been strangled by the creature as part of the creature's big revenge plan against Victor. I mean, you guys, you guys are never going to guess what Victor does next. So Victor has another mental breakdown and ends up traveling back home with his father to recover and rest up. Like, I get it. It's a, it's a stressful time for him, but buckle up, buttercup. This is what happens when you try and play God and then decide it's too hard and give up. His father obviously is having a rough time as well. Like his son was killed and then the nanny was killed and then his other son's friend. Like there's some, there's some weird stuff going on. And his father believes that there is actually a curse going on. So he begs Victor to go on with the original plan for him to marry Elizabeth, as apparently this was his mother's, like, final wish. So his father thinks that if he continues and goes forward with that wish, it will lift the curse, will break the curse. So Victor agrees. And back in Geneva, he's planning his wedding to Elizabeth. But at the same time, he's also preparing to fight the creature. If you remember, the creature's final threat was... I will be with you on your wedding night. So Victor is preparing for this wedding and preparing for this fight to the death with the creature. So he arms himself with pistols and daggers and just goes for it. Victor tells Elizabeth to stay in her room while he goes out to look for the fiend. Whilst he is searching the grounds and the rest of the house, the fiend breaks in. He breaks in, he finds Elizabeth, and he strangles her. The death toll in this book is really racking up at this point. So while Victor's out in the grounds, he sees the creature through the window to the bedroom, and the creature, like, points at Elizabeth's body. Victor tries to shoot him, but you know, it doesn't work. The creature escapes, and just to further this just horrible series of events that has now occurred, Victor's father is just absolutely distraught after the death of Elizabeth, just on top of everything else as well, and like, the dude is old, so he's not exactly in the best physical health anyway. Elizabeth was technically his daughter, so he ends up dying like a few days later from just grief and just old age, and yeah, he just clocks out. So at this point, I was fully expecting Victor to just just have another straight up breakdown, but I don't know, I guess he takes a leaf out of the creature's book and just vows to get his revenge. So yeah, he's going after the creature, he's tracking him down all over the place, he travels across Europe chasing him down, through Russia, but the creature is always just like one step ahead of him. And it eventually leads to the Arctic and then onto the North Pole. He manages to get within like a mile of the creature, but then just collapses from exhaustion and hypothermia. I feel like he needs to see a doctor. His, his constitution is so bad. Obviously, after he's collapsed, the creature escapes and it's it kind of brings it back around to the very beginning of the story where Victor meets the captain who saves him. Now, the ship gets stuck in pack ice again and several of the crew members end up dying in the cold before they're able to get free. And as a result of this, the rest of them are like insisting like, no, let's just Let's go home. Let's go back south. This is this feels like a cursed trip at this point. We don't want to carry on with it. Now, Victor. Ooh, Victor does not like this. Victor gets really angry with the crew for wanting to leave. He ends up giving them this, like, super rousing speech, just encouraging them to, like, persevere. Like, it's a good speech, but it doesn't work. They don't want to carry on. And I'm not being funny, but, like, Victor, like, shut up, man. Who are you to be giving this crew? Like, they're not your crew. Get back in your corner. Whilst the captain... Like, does want to continue. He knows that if he does continue, it will inevitably lead to a mutiny with the crew. So the captain's like, yep, we're done. We'll leave him. But Victor, Victor vows that he's going to stay behind and he's going to finish his hunt for the creature. Which, like, I get it. I mean, what else has he got to go back to? His father's dead. His wife is dead. His friend is dead. His, he destroyed his lab. Like, kind of backed yourself into a corner there, didn't you, Victor? So yeah, he vows to keep hunting the creature. But then uh, he dies. And his final words to the captain were to seek happiness in tranquility and avoid ambition. Because, like, that was the whole point of him telling his story in the first place, because he was like, he saw that obsessive need for ambition and greatness in the captain and was warning him, like, hey, don't do it, it'll ruin your life. But then got annoyed with the crew when they didn't want to keep doing that. And then he's like, oh, fine, screw you guys, I'm going to carry on. And then as he's dying, he's like, actually, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about Victor. He's kind of a mess. Now, a little bit later on, the captain discovers the creature 
on the boat, mourning over Fitz's body. Because, you know, for all his revenge plans and everything else, he tells the captain that Victor's death didn't bring him any peace. And that the crimes that he'd committed in his revenge against Victor, it made him more miserable than Victor ever was. So the creature then vows to burn himself on a funeral pyre so that no one will ever know of his existence. The novel ends with the captain watching the creature drift away never to be seen again and yeah it was kind of that's that's the end of the novel like it's oh hang on a sec okay i'm back don't ask me what happened with the lower lashes they they were fine and then they weren't i i don't don't want to talk about it but what i do want to talk about is more frankenstein stuff because although we have come to the end of the novel i still have plenty more to talk about and to be fair i still have a lot of makeup that's finished so let's uh, say let's just carry on. And so in the novel, the creature is referred to as Adam, as in the first man in the Garden of Eden. And there's a conversation that he has with Frankenstein when he refers to himself as a fallen angel, the quote being, I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel. And obviously in this case, the fallen angel refers to Lucifer. It's a very reoccurring theme because Victor often call him like demon and devil. A lot of people believe that the creature is kind of based off a mixture of Percy, Mary's husband, and someone called Thomas Paine, who I'm not gonna lie, I did have to look him up, and I was mildly embarrassed to then find out that he is not only another author and friend of Mary's, but he was also one of the most influential and important figures for the American Revolution. I I had no idea. So, the creature's hatred for his creator Victor and his desire to have a mate look after children, that kind of thing. It mirrors Percy's familial relationships, you know, his rebellion against his own family and Percy's desire to have children with Mary and want to adopt kids and all that kind of stuff. But another little factoid was that Percy's sister and Victor's wife were both called Elizabeth. So, I don't know, maybe maybe there is a bit of inspiration going on there. Percy was obviously a very influential figure within Mary's life, so it would make sense that she would transfer some of that into her work. Oh, Perso? Perso? Also, Percy used the name Victor as like a pen name for some of his poems. Oh, and another thing, whilst Percy was at Eton, he excelled quite a bit in chemistry and he experimented a lot with electricity and magnetism. Actually, yeah, now that I list them all out together, there is quite a lot of parallels between the creature and Percy in terms of their behaviour and just general themes within the novel. I mean, Percy was the one who encouraged her to write it, so. Now, the creature's desire to do good and his subsequent persecution as a result, it can be said that it sort of echoes and mirrors Thomas Paine's, like, utopian visions for the world and his subsequent fate in England. So, like I said, I don't know too much about Thomas Paine. I didn't do too much research into him because I didn't want to. So, do you remember how at the beginning I said the subtitle of the book was The Modern Prometheus? Well... That led me down an entirely separate rabbit hole, which I could make its own video on because it obviously delves into Prometheus in terms of Greek mythology. Now, I absolutely adore Greek mythology. I am so fascinated by it. It's so messed up. Like, it's just, I don't know what it is about it. I just, The modern Prometheus was the original sort of like subtitle for the book, though it has since been dropped in any modern prints and it's only sort of used in like the prologue for the book. Hold on, I have to do line work, so I need to concentrate for a second. Okay, that makes my neck look so short. Right, so Prometheus. In Greek mythology, in versions of Greek mythology, Prometheus was the titan who created like humanity and humankind. Prometheus also taught the humans to hunt, but ended up, tricking Zeus into accepting like poor quality offerings from the humans like I, I don't know he taught us to hunt and then throw us under the boss Zeus was not exactly known for his forgiving nature he then withheld fire from the humans and obviously back then fire was you know it's fairly important for us this ended up leading to Prometheus taking back the fire and giving it to the humans as a way of being like hey I stole this fire for you, even though I'm the reason it was taken away from me in the first place. Again, obviously Zeus, none too happy about this, so he sentenced Prometheus to eternal punishment by fixing him to a rock, where every day an eagle would come and peck out his liver, only for it to grow back the next day, because he has the immortality of a god. So it's just this eternal punishment of specifically his liver being eaten every day. Mary Shelley was, she was a Pythagorean. Do you know Pythagoras, the triangle guy? Well, the whole like philosophy 
to do with him. So basically, Mary Shelley believed that Prometheus was a devil rather than a hero. She blamed him for bringing fire to the humans, which in turn seduced them into the vice of eating meat. The tangent from deep-seated Greek mythology to vegetarianism? I didn't see that coming. Because yeah, it turns out her husband wrote several essays on what would later become known as vegetarianism. So I, I guess from that it is safe to assume that she was a vegetarian as well. But yeah, so that was just like a little tidbit on the whole subtitle thing. Now, going back to uh, everything else, the novel was originally published anonymously. Percy wrote like the preface, 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 the intro bit, and there was a dedication to Mary Shelley's father within it as well. It didn't exactly take long to put two and two together and figure out that it was her book. And it wasn't until the second edition was published in 1823 that earned Mary Shelley the title of author on the cover. So the original first edition was published in three separate volumes, which was apparently standard for first editions back then. And then in 1831, a super popular single volume edition was published, but it had a lot of like super heavy revisions from Mary to make the story less like radical, I guess. Because obviously you've got to remember that she came from a very politically radical kind of background with her father and her upbringing and a lot of those views were reflected in her novel which you know at the time probably ruffled some feathers so this edition is the one that is the most widely read and recognized but there are some editions of the original 1818 texts and a lot of people and a lot of scholars especially believe that the original was a lot more true to mary's spirit and her beliefs the one that she had to revise was to make it a bit friendlier a bit less radical whereas the first one that was just all her Oh, I should have powdered my neck more. I think I've just ruined this eyeliner. Whoopsies! The novel has been both well-received and kind of disregarded ever since the first, like, anonymous edition was published. Unfortunately, it was disregarded a hell of a lot more when it was found out that the author was a woman. I mean, a, a teenage girl at that. Like, that- people couldn't wrap their heads around that. Unfortunately, she was often held against, like, the backdrop of her father's success, so people thought she was kind of- I don't know, I guess people thought she was a bit of, like, a nepo baby in that respect, like, kind of piggybacking off his success. Joke's on them, I knew her name, not his. But I mean, despite all that, the novel gained like almost immediate success and popularity, especially with like theatre adaptations and stage, that kind of thing. It like, it went wild. Despite the fact that a lot of the success and popularity really picked up the pace like a long, long time after the novel was written. It was successful enough in her time that Mary Shelley was actually able to see a production of a show called Presumption or The Fate of Frankenstein in 1823. The novel is very frequently recommended by scholars, historians, psychologists. This novel is a hit and has been for a very, very long time, considering it's like over 200 years old. It's considered today to be a landmark work of like one of the best romantic gothic novels ever written. And a lot of professors state that the creature is the perfect example of addressing like the fundamental question of like being a human, which is like to meet your maker and question you know, why am I here? What am I, what am I doing? Why was I made? It has inspired numerous films, TV shows, games, characters, and Frankenstein's monster is, to date, one of the most recognisable horror characters ever. The first film adaptation was all the way back in 19... It was a short film, it was only 16 minutes long, and it was actually believed to be like a lost film up until like 1980. There was a collector who had a print of it in 1950, but just had no idea how like rare and valuable it was. So they've managed to recover the footage of it, but obviously it was a silent film. So in this little like short version of it, Victor creates the creature in like this big vat. The creature has various encounters with Victor, all the way up until Victor's wedding night, where true love makes the creature vanish. I was a bit weird. Then in 1915, another silent movie adaptation was made. And again, this one is considered a lost film. I don't think I've managed to recover the footage for this one. It's called Life Without Soul. It's about Dr. William Frawley, who's a modern day Frankenstein, and he creates a man without a soul. But after creating this like soulless man and all their hijinks or whatever it is they get up to, it would turn out that, um, spoiler alert, it wasn't real. It would turn out that a young man just dreamed up the entire thing after he fell asleep reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is not working how I want it to and I'm getting annoyed. There was another silent film made in 1921. This was actually an Italian film and the name of the film translated into Monster of Frankenstein. Now I really couldn't find any information about like what this film was about because again 
it's been lost. And obviously because it was Italian as well, like any translation, like it just, I couldn't find anything. Then comes 1931, the first sound adaptation produced by Universal, simply called Frankenstein. Now, this is the most well-known and most commonly referred to film adaptation of the novel. A lot of people actually mix up the details of the original Frankenstein story for this film because it is actually quite different from the novel. Especially when people think of Frankenstein, they think of the monster from that film rather than the original description from the novel. The film has actually been selected for preservation by the US National Film Registry, which is like a collection of films selected for their cultural or historical importance, their aesthetic, that kind of thing. And it's similar to how you get like listed buildings here in the UK that you then can't do anything with. The film was adapted from a play that was produced in 1927, which in turn was adapted from Mary Shelley's novel. So for some reason in this one, it's not Victor Frankenstein, it's Henry Frankenstein, but there is a Victor in the, the film as well. Like, I, just, I don't know. So Henry Frankenstein is an obsessive scientist who digs up graves with his assistant with assistant. He digs up graves with his assistant Fritz in order to assemble a living body from parts of other not living bodies. It received a lot of like commercial success and was generally very well liked by sort of critics and audiences alike. It did spawn a number of spin-offs and even a few sequels from Universal themselves. Yeah, it's no wonder that it's still talked about and relevant today. And it was the Universal film in 1931 that created the like super iconic imagery of the crazy maniacal mad scientist and his little hunchback assistant because you know how whenever you hear about like the mad scientist assistant they're always called eagle i thought that's where that was from but no this one was called fritz i don't know where the eagle thing came from and obviously the other iconic part of the film is their depiction of the monster it's the flat top the scar on the forehead the neck bolts the green skin and the like protruding forehead which i didn't realize until i was doing research into this all of those aspects put together are actually copyrighted by Universal, which is why you get a lot of spin-offs that have mild differences to them, because basically, if you create a character that contains each one of those things, it's it's a copyrighted character, basically. So you can take a few details and put them together, but you just can't have all of them. But it's okay, because I do not have a flat top head, a protruding forehead, or a forehead scar. But still, please don't sue me. Anyway, so basically the story within the film, it was genuinely fascinating. I really liked the way this story was told. I liked, I really liked the novel as well. It wasn't what I expected it to be. In this one, obviously the monster is made up of body parts, um, including a brain, which Henry needs to source from somewhere. Now, his former teacher, whose name I have forgot, but basically his former teacher is teaching a class and he's showcasing them these two different brains. One of them is a healthy brain from the average Joe kind of person. And then the other one is a corrupted brain from a criminal. So Henry instructs his assistant to go and steal one of these brains for him. Specifically, the healthy one. And I mean, I'm sure you can already see where this is going. So Fritz trundles along to steal the brain, but in his attempts to get it, he accidentally damages the healthy brain and he just gets the corrupt brain and brings that one instead. Henry's creature is brought to life by harnessing the electricity from a lightning storm. And again, it's that iconic imagery. It's the creature laid out on this big stone tab. The roof of the the lab opens, it's raised up, and the lightning strikes and is conducted through the bolts in his neck. And that leads to the super iconic scene of the it's alive moment. Which again, I don't know why I thought that was in the original novel. It is not. That is a movie line. Despite his hulking, awful, grotesque form, the creature has a really kind of childlike innocence to them. Henry sort of welcomes the creature down and tells him to take a seat and the creature does. Fritz comes in with a torch and it scares the creature and it's like a little freak out. People think it's like mistakenly trying to attack them. So the creature is then thrown into a dungeon and locked up where Fritz continues to like antagonize it with a torch for whatever reason. But I mean, he gets what's coming to him because Henry then hears Fritz screaming. So he runs down to the dungeon where they find that the creature has like forcibly hanged him. So now Henry and his former teacher, the, you know, the one they stole the brain from, I think they brought him in to like witness the creature being brought to life or whatever. Henry and his teacher agree to work together and they agree that the creature needs to be destroyed. So they come up with this plan and then there's a whole big 
scuffle, kerfuffle that happens involving some drugs and a big old needle. It ends with the creature unconscious on the floor and Henry collapsed from exhaustion from trying to fight him and subdue him. Henry's teacher, Woolman, that was the name. So yeah, creature is unconscious on the floor. Henry has collapsed from exhaustion because the men in these films and stories, like, they are weak. And the teacher, Mr. Waldman, assuring Henry, like, don't worry, you, you get better, I'll, I'll deal with it. So the teacher has got hold of the creature and he's got him, like, in his little lab and he's preparing to, like, destroy him. Like, he's fascinated by it, which, you know, is understandable. So he starts, like, studying the creature rather than destroying it, like he said he would. But the creature wakes up and strangles him, too. So then similar to Mary Shelley's novel, the creature flees again and goes off into the wilderness. He ends up meeting a farmer's young daughter, a little girl named Maria, and they kind of become like friends. She was showing them this little game she was playing where she was just like throwing flowers onto a lake. But so she's, she's throwing these flowers onto this lake, the creature joins in, it's all lovely and, and heartwarming and ah, oh. and then it's not. In what would eventually turn out to be an incredibly controversial scene, the creature runs out of flowers to throw into the lake and he ends up picking up Maria and throwing her, inadvertently drowning her. I thought the novel side of it was sad, like this was just, this was awful. Like I said, that has long since been a really controversial scene and during the original release, the second part of that scene, the bit where Maria drowns in the lake, it was cut out by several state censorship boards and there was another line that they also objected to that they considered like blasphemous. It's basically where Henry refers to himself as god or like compares himself to god because he's created life skipping back to henry for a moment he's recovering from his little breakdown he's preparing to marry his elizabeth all is well in his life because as far as he's aware his former teacher has taken on the monster and that's all he needs to worry about what is it with like the frankenstein men and just letting other people deal with their problems him and elizabeth are set to marry once waldman returns after destroying the creature but Surprise, surprise, Waldman doesn't return because he's dead. So they find out that Waldman has been murdered and obviously Victor's like, oh shit. And then it gets real dark. So Maria, the little girl who drowned in the lake, her father turns up carrying her body and eventually all the villagers form this like lynch mob and they go out to get the creature. The mobs pitchforks the works. During this like rampage and mob hunt, Henry manages to get attacked and captured because... Oh, sorry, why wouldn't he? And the creature drags him to this, like, windmill thing, drags him up to the top, and just, like, throws him out. Now, Henry doesn't die from this because as he falls, he hits, like, one of the, the wooden blades of the windmill. It kind of, like, breaks his fall, which saves his life. But obviously, he's, like, super, super injured and, you know, not in a great shape. So a bunch of the villagers manage to, like, get to him, sort of carry him off to safety so he can... Once again, rest and recover while everyone else does the job for him. And then the rest of the villagers, they like surround the windmill and they just set it on fire. And obviously the creature is still trapped inside. The film ends with Henry back at home with his family, celebrating his marriage to Elizabeth. And Henry wins, I guess. I So as I said before, the film is subject to like a lot of cuts and censorship issues because of a lot of the themes and the scenes that were in it. Even by today's standards, some of those scenes would be a bit like... A lot of the footage that was cut out was actually lost. The scene with Maria being drowned was only rediscovered, I think, in the 80s again, which has then since been restored to like modern prints of the film. The film was actually banned in quite a few different countries as well. After this film, Universal made a sequel to it, which is... The Bride of Frankenstein. Now, this was 1935, so this was a little while later. Apparently, there was already discussions about making a sequel as the first one was released. Like, they knew what they wanted to do with this. A quick little rundown of this one. So, it takes place, like, immediately after the events of the first film. Which, at first, I was a bit like... Huh? I thought the monster was dead. The monster was literally made of body parts and brought back to life so i'm sure they could have reanimated it if they really want to do so yeah it takes place like immediately after the events of the first film and it's a lot more rooted in the concepts and stories of the original novel the opening of the film is actually mary shelley herself sat with her husband and lord byron in a castle on a stormy night and basically it's her husband and lord byron praising her for the story of frankenstein so obviously it very directly acknowledges 
Mary Shelley. She then reminds them that the original origins for the story is meant to be kind of like a cautionary tale. Her intention for writing the novel was to impart a moral lesson to do with the consequences of mortal men who basically try and play God. So after they've done their little intro discussion around the fire in this dully castle, it goes back to the scene of the windmill with the angry lynch mob and the, the burning windmill basically. Henry has obviously been rescued and taken off to recover from his fall. Obviously, the villagers all believe that the monster is dead. Maria's father, do you remember Maria, it's the little girl? So he comes forward and basically he wants to confirm that the monster is dead, which, yeah, I mean, fair enough, the monster is the one that took his daughter away. So, and I'm not really funny, how many situations have we seen in horror films especially where they just assume the big bad guy is dead and then it's like, oh, no, they're not. So he goes into the windmill only to find that the bottom of the windmill has like collapsed and there's a big pit that's been like flooded and he accidentally falls into said pit and who is there alongside him in this pit you ask it's the not so friendly green giant the creature because yes the creature did survive the fall obviously otherwise it would be the world's worst sequel although actually as a side note on that the bride of frankenstein is considered to be one of the best sequels to a film ever made. Some people actually consider it to be better than the original Frankenstein, especially in like the horror genre, art sequels are always a bit... So yeah, for it to have this amount of praise is quite impressive, to be honest. So the monster has survived the fall and the burning and everything, and Maria's father falls into the pit with the monster where the monster then strangles him. Yeah, just straight off the bat we've got more more murder. For some reason, so the monster like climbs up out of the pit and then grabs Maria's father's wife and like throws her in there as well so she dies. So once he's climbed out of the pit, he then encounters Henry's servant girl, who's called Minnie, I think. She manages to like flee because she's just, she's just straight up terrified. Like she's just seen this monster come out of this burning windmill. Two more people have died. Like it's a whole big thing. So we then go back to dear old Henry because Minnie flees back to the castle where Henry is being sort of like nursed back to health once again by his wife Elizabeth and Minnie tries to warn them that obviously you know hey you know that thing that we've been trying really hard to kill and you all thought is dead well he's not dead and he's killing more people so maybe keep an eye out for that but guess what she basically gets ignored. We then, like, I don't know if there's, like, a little time drop or whatever, but we're back with Henry and he's meeting with his former mentor, a man called, like, Dr. Pretorius, basically, this former mentor of his wants to work with him to create another another creature. Now, Pretor Pretorius specifically wants to create a partner, a companion, a mate for this creature. So he proposes that, obviously, to try and avoid what happened with this creature, they grow an artificial brain for it. That way, you know, it won't be the corrupt brain of a criminal. You know, they can make it a nice brain, make it a nice monster. Happy families for everyone. His former partner says, hey, tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll grow you the brain. There's like a shot of him in his lab and he's like showing Henry that he's grown all these like things. I think that it's a homun homunculi, homunculus. I don't know, he's growing stuff. There's like some really disturbing stuff in there as well. Like it's mad scientist 2.0. So he's like, I'll grow you a brain uh, if you can get body parts for me. And then, you know, we just mash them together. Do the monster mash. <laughs> and then we go... Back to the monster who's just, oh, he's just having a real, real bad time. In huge contrast to the accidental drowning of the young girl Maria, the monster actually saves a woman from drowning. But when she kind of like comes to, she sees the monster and she starts screaming and is hysterical, even though he saved her. And unfortunately, there were like two hunters nearby who heard her screaming, came over, thought she was being attacked. So they shot at the creature who ran away. He then happens upon an old blind hermit in the woods who, similar to the blind father in the novel, he befriends him, they chat, they share a meal together. I say they chat. So the, the old blind hermit kind of teaches him a few basic words. Words like friend and good. The blind hermit, like he thanks God for sending him a friend because, you know, he's old and blind and a hermit. And obviously the creature's really happy with this. He's like, hey, I got a friend. And this friend is teaching him stuff and like... Yeah, it's all, it's all lovely. Except that it's not. The two hunters, they find the old hermit's cottage, they recognise the creature from before, and so they attack him again. Basically, the cottage, like, accidentally burns down. The creature has to flee once again into the night, whilst the hunters take the hermit away to safety. And he ends up hiding out in a crypt, 
where he happens to see who other than Dr. Pretorius. Yeah, so while he's in this crypt, he just so happens to see Dr. Pretorius and like two of his little cronies digging through a bunch of graves and burials to get body parts and bones and other such things. So obviously the creature's like, what's going on here? The creature approaches and learns that Dr. Pretorius is planning to create him a mate. I will point out though, at this point, Henry has not actually agreed to do this. Henry's actually refused to do this, but Pretorius tells the creature that he's, he's going to get him to do it. They start like kind of working together and they come up with this little little scheme to get Henry on board. So they basically gang off on him to try and get him to agree to create this second creature. And once again, Henry refuses. He's like, uh-uh, nope, nope. Once Henry f refuses, once again, Pretorius gives like a special signal to the creature. The creature goes off and kidnaps Elizabeth. And that's when Pretorius basically just blackmails Henry by saying, hey, if you, uh, if you help me, create this mate for the creature then we'll let your wife go and she'll be fine but you know if you don't henry wants to protect his wife so he says yes the bride for the creature is then made in the original lab tower place and um, when it comes to animating her it's it's the same again big stormy night she's put on the big slab raised up through the roof it was a very iconic visual she's like covered in bandages she's absolutely beautiful as well and she has this like really iconic hair it's so cool she's raised up on this slab big lightning strike so once she's been made the og monster comes down and approaches her he simply says the word friend like he's reaching out for and he's like friend but she just screams at him and just rejects him completely. The monster simply replies by saying like, oh, she hate me like others. So he's got like super, super primitive language skills, but he recognizes that she's rejected him like everyone else has, which is just so sad. I mean, okay, yeah, you, you, but you murdered a bunch of people, but I'm not a friend. As a result of this rejection though, the monster goes on a bit of a rampage in the lab and he just like destroys everything. So he apparently turns around to Henry and Elizabeth though. He just points at them stating, go, you live, go, and gives them the chance to flee and escape with their lives. But then he turns to the bride and Pretorius and he says, you stay, we belong dead. So after Henry and Elizabeth escape, there's like a really iconic scene of the bride just hissing at him. And then apparently like a single tear rolls down his cheek as he pulls a lever, which makes the entire lab just explode. Now, the original ending for that film was meant to have Henry die whilst he's trying to escape the castle, like in the explosion. And apparently if you watch it, you can still see the actor that plays Henry. He's still like in the lab when it explodes. Like, on the screen, he's still in there, but obviously, story-wise, he manages to escape. I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah, like, they threatened his wife, but, like, Henry, you weren't as bad as the first film, like, especially when you got Pretorius as well, but, like, you're still kind of a dick. Why don't you get to live when everyone else had to die? We are almost done with our story. We're kind of rounding down to the last bit. I think the last bits I really need to do is just, like, the hair and the outfit, so I'm just gonna run off camera real quick and just change, and then I can come back and do my little, my final thoughts and the last few little fun facts for you. Why am I just sticky so much on my hands? Let me just go finish this off, and then I'll be back, and we can talk about it. Okay, the layers involved for this outfit are making me sweat. This hair is also making me sweat, and I managed to rub off, like, all the line work I did on my neck, so we're just, we're just gonna finish the story, and then we can come back and talk about this, because another fun fact about this film. The actress who played the bride of Frankenstein's monster was the same actress who played Mary Shelley in the little like prologue bit at the beginning. It was to represent how the story and just horror in general stems from the dark side of the imagination. I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with that, like representation as such, but I just I just thought it was quite cool that they used the same actress for both, especially because it was so much more of a nod to the original novel but the attention to detail that went into this sequel was insane especially for the makeup department which i appreciate greatly they took the original monster design from the 1931 film and made like quite subtle alterations to it that would be consistent with the damage and injuries that he would have sustained from what happened in the windmill so burn scars that kind of thing and throughout the course of the film, they very slowly healed all the injuries as well to show that he was healing. I know nowadays things like continuity, stuff like that is, is fairly commonplace, but I think especially back then, that level of attention to detail is just 
Now, there was a bit of drama surrounding the decision to let the monster speak in this film. The actor who portrayed the monster was really against allowing the monster to speak. Now, the actor actually had a dental plate that he had to wear, and because they went ahead with the decision to let the monster speak, it meant that he couldn't remove it during filming. So, if you were to compare the, like, the monster designs between the first and second film, the second one, they lost a lot of the like sunken cheek effect, because obviously he's got this dental plate in it fills it out massively. The makeup artist for the films obviously also worked on The Bride, creating the super iconic hairstyle that she had that I didn't realise was actually based on ne uh, ne Never Nefertiti? Never Once again, this film did face a lot of censorship censorship, censorship issues. Again, over various lines where Henry and his work were compared to the work of God and creating human life, blah, 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 blah. But there was also a lot of censorship and debate over just the sheer quantity of murders that took place throughout the screen, both like on screen and implied. So there were a few deaths that were like cut out of the film. I mean, I even said at the beginning, like literally straight away, you'd got Maria's father and then his wife as well for, I mean, the wife, why? I don't, why? But again, the film was like voluntarily withdrawn from a few countries and there were some countries that just outright rejected it. Universal did go on to make several more films, including The Son of Frankenstein, which is kind of the third one in that little set. And they then went on to make like a bunch of other films, but the rest of them weren't really as good or as notable. The rest of the like Frankenstein franchise that they had kind of marked the slow descent into like B-movie territory. And I think the final one they did in that was actually like I think it was a comedy. It was like Albert and Costello meet Frankenstein or something. Over here in Great Britain, Hammer Films created a long ongoing TV series inspired around the story and the novel and the characters. And this went from like the 50s to the 70s, I think. And it included the pilot for like a TV series, but that eventually got scrapped. And a lot of the film depictions have like a really big variation in how the creature is depicted from being this like mindless hulking killer to more of the like the tragic hero as he was written in Mary Shelley's novel. So it is really interesting to see the disparities between how he's portrayed in each adaptation of it. Now since the 50s, like over 30 plus films have been made all around the world using the name, the characters, or the concepts, that kind of thing. Like the list is huge. Even more films than that take the concepts and theories of the, the general sort of like plot line of it, the idea of like the mad scientist and creating something from stitching things to get like, it's one of the most commonplace tropes in horror and science fiction, all because of this. One thing I didn't know as an example, which I thought was really, really cool. In the 1983 Star Wars film Return of the Jedi, Darth Sidious's force lightning effects were based on the ones used in the original Frankenstein film. But there's a huge mix of film genres that have used the characters and the names, horror, sci-fi, comedies, kids shows, animated series, comics, both DC and Marvel, both really high budget and really low budget as well. I curated a little list of just some of the examples of TV shows and films and franchises that have like utilised certain elements. So you've got the more obvious ones like Hotel Transylvania, obviously. Looney Tunes, there was a feature in the Beatles music video for the Yellow Submarine. You've got serial mascots like Frankenberry. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is technically a musical parody of Frankenstein. Loads of like Disney and Mickey Mouse shorts, Winnie the Pooh, SpongeBob SquarePants, Ben 10, repeated references and characters in the Simpsons Tree House of Horror series. Herman Munster was obviously the patriarch of like a family of monster and he was very much the physical embodiment of Universal's depiction of the Frankenstein monster. The Adams Family Butler Lurch, again the comparisons are there. There's repeated references in Doctor Who, X-Files, Criminal Minds. There was even an animated segment on Sesame Street about like a mad doctor who brought to life a Frankenstein-esque monster but um, it was the letter H. But there was also a huge list of like over 30 plus songs that have Frankenstein in the name or again references to the story and the characters and a huge number of bands that have Frankenstein in their band name. Obviously there's been a huge number of plays and theatre productions of it. Frankenstein's monster has also appeared in lots of video games. I didn't even realise there was reference to him in one of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. I think it's, it's called like Franken Freddy or Franken Bear or something. Lego also released a Dr. Frankenstein and Monster set and obviously Mattel, 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 Mattel partnered with Universal to create the original lineup of the Monster High characters which brings us all the way back to Frankenstein. 
That was a long-winded story. What do you think? Mindless killing machine or tragic victim of circumstance, tragic hero. And what do we think of Victor and or Henry in this scenario? Mad genius entrepreneur or arsehole? Let me know what you guys think down below. I would love to know what your guys' thoughts are or anything else that you know that is kind of cool about this whole history thing. Let me know what you think of the look. Generally, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. I'm not gonna lie. I really enjoyed doing this and I would like to keep doing it. Let me know if you would like to see more videos like this, especially on the kind of monsters, myths, that kind of thing. Whether it doesn't necessarily have to be like Monster High characters, but obviously I can do Monster High character makeup while looking into the history of that particular monster. Or even if there's any other myths, urban legends, folklore, that kind of thing, I'm, I'm so distractingly obsessed with this kind of stuff. Like I said, like Greek mythology, all that shit just it would be cool to turn it into like a series. I can maybe call it like Monsters, Myths and Makeup. But if you've made it to the end here, you are a trooper. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Why do I always sing that bit? I don't need to sing it.